Hello wonderful humans and welcome back to another one of my videos where I talk about the Dragon Reborn. Um, today I'm actually going to be doing chapter 28 to 35. I was supposed to do chapter 28 in my last video but for some reason I forgot and so I'm going to do um, eight chapters today instead of my normal seven and I'm also probably maybe going to film the next video straight after this just because I'm severely behind and I would like to catch up before the end of the month but that's the plan um I'm gonna really probably get straight into it um there's not a whole lot else I need to say in case you're new here go back and watch the rest of my videos um but I'm reading a chapter at a time and writing down notes in my trusty journal one page per chapter and they are my initial thoughts they are they're unfiltered pretty much i i put some extra information as i speak to you but sometimes as i pointed out in the comments and last last video i think sometimes i say something in my notes and i read it to you knowing full well that it's wrong or knowing full well that the answer is coming in the next chapter or in the next video or anything i am literally sharing with you my thoughts in the moment as i finish reading the book so take take from that what you will but i'm going to get started today with chapter 28 a way out i was wondering why they hadn't managed to visit matt yet um the girls i'm talking about here i guess they're not the closest of the emmons fielders and they got busy because life gets busy in Tarvalon. But still, they should have visited him by now. I don't think it's the best idea for Matt to leave just yet, um, given how hungry he is and, and all of those kind of things. But also, there's probably no stopping him if that's what he wants to do. So, all good. It was sprung on him, so I doubt he's really thought that through at all. The girls just sort of decided that this is what he was going to do without knowing everything. I'm surprised, though, that Neneve knows he's still weak and is letting him go and do this, even if he looks healthy. I just think knowing this is probably one of those moments that I can understand it, again, like with many things. I get it, but it shows... Neneve's not necessarily acting true to how she would normally because of her stress and because of her the trauma that she's experiencing and also maybe because Matt is diff she treats Matt slightly different to how she treats the others um he's that annoying younger brother um who needs to grow up and so she's going to give him that bit of responsibility and that kick um, to move forward and grow up. This is just me sort of um, thinking it through. I, I think this was just one of those moments. Neneve, to me, once, if there was that healing going on, she would normally tell them to keep it, keep, um, keep still, keep safe, rest up, all those kind of things. So for her to just be like, yep, yeah, go deliver this letter. <laughs> and I think there was more going on. And if she'd really known um, what, the Emile and Seat had told Matt, I don't think she would have acted in the same way. So that's interesting, I think. Um, Matt definitely has kept that on the down low, which makes sense. It makes sense for all their characters and the situation that they're in. So I love that um, a characteristic that you would think that Neneve is that healer and wants to sort of uh, keep them safe um, would normally tend to make her want Matt to stay in the tower for now anyway even though she doesn't trust it but what's actually really happening here is that ex extra stress means she's not thinking in the same way and it's again it's just so real it, it feels like that's exactly what happens to people in these situations they don't act exactly the same that they would if there was no stress around them and it's it's great just just really, really nice um, when I break it down. I wonder if he'll get away on his own or if someone will decide to journey with him. As long as it's not Celine or Lanfear who decides to journey with him, I'm okay with it. Um, I think he needs a travel companion. So I'm looking forward to seeing who that might potentially be or what danger and, um, and trouble he comes across on his own. 
their default appears to be to keep secrets now the girls particularly but all of them i wonder if a gwen had gone on her own without her ring on if matt would have been more open um to them um so if a gwen a gwen with Nanive and Elaine wearing their Aes Sedai rings put across, like they come across very differently to Matt now than they did when they were just villagers together. So, and even a Gwen going on her own with the Aes Sedai ring would have been a different situation to Nanive and Elaine being in the room too. So few a few things there. I wonder if he would have been more open and, and upfront about what was going on. He's obviously got the ability to hide what he's thinking when he wants to, which is a really great gambling skill, <laughs> which will come in handy, no doubt. He is thinking through everything, and I believe he sees this as his only opportunity to get away from the Aes Sedai. Um, and that's really what he wants to do. He wants out of all of the Emmons Fielders. He is the one with the most distrust now even though I'd say Nanive probably still has equal distrust but it's coming across in a different way and she's realized that she's got to work within it whereas Matt just wants out so actually Matt and Nanive have a lot more in common than they would ever admit to each other which is great but I am worried about what he'll face on his own as I said luckily he did take a staff from um his bout with uh Gawain and Gallard earlier so he has something he can use that isn't too obtrusive and too noticeable um, having a staff is a good thing but I don't like that he's being separated from the horn or the dagger um, when I think about it I feel that that story Matt and the dagger are not done yet um, and I don't know exactly where it's going but it just doesn't sit right with me that he's separated from the horn at the very least and then I ask the question, is he going to be the first Eamon's Fielder to make it home? Because that's all I'm waiting for right now. No, I'm waiting for many things. I'm just expecting one of them to get home at some point. And I'm not sure if they're all going to get there at the same time, which is probably more likely. But at, at this point in time, I'm sitting there thinking, maybe Matt's going to go drop this letter off and then he's going to go home. And then we get to find out what's happening in Eamon's Field and that would be nice. Chapter 29, A Trap to Spring. So more game playing from the Amer Merlin. <laughs> and here, this is when I, I, I was thinking about it. And I think I was reflecting on something to do with King Arthur. And I've realized, you may notice that I am stumbling less over this word than I was initially, because I've realized that um, it is like a Merlin. Um, Merlin from King Arthur. And it just, it makes more sense now and I, I'm sad to say that it took until chapter 29 <laughs> for me to notice that um, so there you go <laughs> she knew Elaine would be in on the hunt at least there'll be no surprise when the three of them go missing which is a good thing and with gold to help along the way which is going to be a lot better for them <laughs> Nanive better take most of it as the other two may not use it wisely a Gwen needs to learn when to keep her mouth closed. This is the constant. I've said this so many times that it's going to take a while for her to learn this, I'd say. But um, just that instant where Nanive picks up what's going on so much quicker. They're trying to, the Amelan seat is trying to get um, Elaine away because she's not supposed to know about what's going on. And a Gwen just she she speaks up even though it, it seems obvious to us that that's what's going on and i think the worked it out a lot quicker and gwen needs to learn when to keep her mouth shut and um, the merlin was really right about that she um and if a gwen had thought about it for even a second she would have realized um that that was what was going on she just needed to think that's all she needs to do a soulless going after Sherian, or is this a warning? That's that's not a good thing. That's it's a concern. Um, I hope Varen taught the girls how to ward themselves at night. Although a soulless will probably be able to get past that, and knowing what we know about wards, maybe it's not a good thing for them to ward themselves. But I hope that they've got enough of those kind of skills heading out on their own in this situation 
they need some of those basic skills. But I, I think they're basic skills anyway, of just protecting themselves so that they don't get in danger down the track. And so it wasn't else. Um, that means Lanfear can take on different faces. Um, something that they needed to know, and that's uh, really, really great that they know that now, and I hope that they can share that information with other people. They should set up a way of knowing each other if they get separated, some sort of code, <laughs> I don't know, um, a way for each of them to know if um, Lanfear has taken on their face. I think that to me seems an obvious thing to do, but I don't know if they've done that. Kalendor as a Sangreal? I hadn't thought of that, but I probably should have. <laughs> that seems seems quite obvious now when I think about it, but it hadn't crossed my mind at the time. Is that what the Black Aja are after in the big scheme of things? Or are they after the other Sangreal, Sa Sangreals in Tia? Um, I, I don't fully know. <laughs> Um, I think the, the wonderful thing about, about this is I can make as many guesses as I like and I'm still going to miss things and Kalendor, it means a lot more. I, I, knew it wasn't, I, I knew that it said it was a sword that's not a sword and that should have been enough with the information that we had but it just makes a lot more sense now. Um, I don't know how I missed that. And the trap. Was it the Black Aja or was it Lanfear or both who left the clues for them to find and sent else? It seems like it's probably Lanfear. I don't know. It, it seems like Lanfear is working on her own thing. Uh, it's completely separate to everyone else. But it doesn't mean that she's not working with the Black Aja when it suits her. So I don't know. Maybe it has nothing to do with the Black Aja. Um, they could have gone to do something completely different. So that makes me think that Lanfear needs the girls to be in Tia, which says that Rand needs the girls in Tia to be able to get Kalendor, or is it just to help make sure that there's enough people there helping him? I'm not quite sure of why Lanfear wants them in Tia. There could be any number of reasons. And again, it, it part, part of it is, is she working with the Black Aja even on occasion or is she completely separate? She seems to have a disdain for the Aes Sedai anyway. So I can imagine it would be very difficult for her to work with them, but it doesn't mean that she's not. Um, yeah, I think that'll be interesting to see Lanfear's... Um, plan unfold whatever that is and try and work out exactly what her motives are she's one of those ones um like a few like Varen for example Varen and Lanfear are probably two of the ones that their motives are the most unclear and I see again lots of similarities between the two <laughs> so interesting I'm very interested to find that one out Chapter 30, The First Toss. So Matt has some incredibly unbelievable good luck. And if he's to be believed, this is new, either connected to the dagger or the healing, if we listen to what Matt thinks is going on. I'd say the dagger makes the most sense in this situation. Maybe a good, a good magic effect from before um, Morda, the Shadow Logoth's darkness warped it. I don't know, maybe maybe the dagger was a good thing and it was a good luck thing and then Morda's influence warped it. Is there a chance it's an ancient dagger? Maybe Aes Sedai or similar, something along those lines, made by Aes Sedai before they said that they wouldn't make more weapons. And what's with the feverish feel that he gets? That's somewhat reminiscent, in a different way, but somewhat reminiscent of um, Rand's feeling after he first knowingly, or the first time we sort of saw him access the source. Not that he knew that he was doing it, but he had that feverish depression kind of thing come on. Um, 
it's it's interesting I don't think he's like I don't think he's male Aes Sedai or anything like that but there's I, I like how there's those questions we've obviously got Perrin who has access to a kind of magic which how connected to the source is that I don't know and then Matt's got this this unbelievable good luck is that connected to the source I don't know is the source the only form of magic I don't know I'm I'm loving it I just the questions are unbelievable and the and how much it is making me invest into this story is unbelievable it's great is it um simply oh the feverish feel is it simply a gambling addiction or is he drifting into something else like Perrin and Randa I feel like the more he accesses it the more he drifts into this past life kind of thing just like the more Brand accesses it, the more he drifts into the Dragon Reborn. And same with Perrin and the wolf thing. Um, the wolf thing. <laughs> is there a name for the wolf thing? Or is it just a wolf thing? Anyway. At least Matt won't starve as long as he's... As long as his luck holds. But I'd say he'll get in some trouble if he doesn't get new clothes. Maybe a horse, you know. Um, he can't have so much money and look like a vagabond. He needs to look the part if he's going to splash money around or they'll think he's a thief or that um or they'll just attack him and and steal all his money and he'll be constantly attacked because people think he's got money i wonder if he'll make it out of the city like that would be interesting um he isn't in a particular hurry to leave which is really interesting when given what I've been reading of in um, Shadow Rising. I just, little, little thing. He's not in a hurry to leave and that seems to mirror what's happening in a Shadow Rising at the moment. So anyway, that's future, future events. I don't want to talk about future events. There's still time for someone to either find him and take him back or to find him and join him on the journey. I think he needs a companion. Is it going to be Tom? That feels right, but I doubt it. Um, again, this is one of those moments. Um, I loved seeing more of the city as Matt <laughs> explored or ran or tried to get away. The city feels more real now than before. It is a city in its own right. It's not just Tarvalon, the tower and Aes Sedai. There is a full on city here. And I think without these scenes, it would have been really easy to forget that those um, the the city around it existed full of normal people and it was really cool to see Matt running through the, running through the city ex, exploring chapter 31 the woman of Tanchico oh Tom is back <laughs> it feels right for so many reasons Matt needed a traveling companion and they'll be really good for each other I actually just think this was one of those really funny things I had no idea and I just remember turning the page and seeing Tom there and going, oh, I was right. <laughs> um, I, it makes the most sense to me um, that Tom would definitely be back, but it was just one of those moments. I'm like, yes, I love this. They'll be good for each other. Matt can give Tom something else to think about other than Dina's death and possibly the fact he killed someone or revenge that seemed to have slipped my mind um i'm assuming tom was involved in something pretty big and i, I can work that out i i did work that out i feel he killed whoever um was in the inn waiting for him the night dina was killed but that doesn't seem to be who he's referring to um again that made a lot more sense once i sort of kept reading and Put a few things together. Matt's also going to have to be more responsible than on other journeys. He can't necessarily rely on Tom's decision making ability if Tom is drunk and so it's going to make um, Tom, well Tom is going to be able to help through his drunkenness or whatever help Matt really come into his own and start exploring what it means to be out on his own um it seems like 
um, Matt would have a lot of crazy ideas, but he was never on his own as such. He, his ideas were always backed by Rand or Perrin, or he'd pull someone else into his hijinks. Um, and if he wasn't doing that, it sounds like his dad was actively involved in his life um, and that he his, he had a really nice family, just from the really little snippets that we've got. So this is probably the first time that Matt is venturing out in any way, shape or form on his own. And I'm really happy that he's not doing it completely on his own, but Tom in the state that he's in and knowing Tom as a mentor character has a much more hands-off approach um, than say Moraine. <laughs> um, Tom will allow Matt to make the decisions because he's just going along for the ride and he'll stay for as long as he stays and he'll leave when their paths um, are no longer going in the same direction. So I think this is a really good thing for Matt just in general for his character growth. So who sent the men after Matt? Are they soulless? Are they dark friends? The dark one sent them or or someone of the Black Aja or Lanfear? Like this it could be any number of people who have it in for Matt. That doesn't seem to fit unless Lanfear wants him to return to the tower. Um, as in Lanfear doesn't seem to fit unless that's what she needs from him to be in the tower at the moment. Um, yeah, the, that's going to be interesting to sort of piece together who is sending these soulless, I'm assuming they're soulless, um, after him and what that means for his journey ongoing. I like that each of the trio have had an adult who is kind of like them. Perrin and Elias, um, Rand and Lan, Matt and Tom. Um, I suppose... In another way, I'm looking, Moraine and Neneve seem to be the clearest fit. Um, they're learning off each other. And and then Egwen, I'm still trying to work out where her sort of adult, but I think Egwen and Elaine work together in this sense for now. So I'm really liking that the, the boys have, the trio, um, Perrin, Rand and Matt, have these adult male figures in their life, other than their parents and um, parents blacksmith um but I, I just think it's a really nice touch these pairings work for what i imagine they need in that moment tom can teach matt some of the bigger game playing he's likely to need um especially around that sort of political game playing and things like that i think that is a really i'm assuming that's going to be a big part of matt's journey he's already got a natural gift for that so he's um, he's going to need to learn more of the nuances of that. And Tom could act as that sort of think that through, this is what this means. Did you think about it this way? I think that could be, be a very good role for Tom as well. I am so invested in Tom and Matt's journey. I just think that is a story I want to hear more about. I think it's going to be really, really great to see. Chapter 32, The First Ship. I had so much to write about for this chapter that I've filled almost every spare space on this. So it's funny how different Matt feels as a character now than what he did at the beginning of The Eye of the World. Rand's perception of him then compared to what's going on in Matt's head now are complete worlds apart. And I'm saying that particularly because this isn't about the dagger in this sense. I'm saying Rand's perception of Matt when they were in in Eamon's field before the dagger came into the picture paint Matt is a very different character to what we see when we actually can see inside his head and I think this is the character that Matt plays as in not the character in the book but this is character in his world that he puts on a little bit of an act for his friends at times as well so a combination of point of view is has shaped that and the dagger has definitely shaped that as well and maybe some of that four month time skip in the great hunt and that him seeing the different viewpoints, if he remembers that, given um, he, he doesn't have all his memories, I don't know how much of that he can remember, but it's all going to be influencing in different ways. His um, near death experience will definitely change him in some way as well. So that's, it all makes sense. Uh, um, possibly Matt has learned um, things, 
or maybe begun to understand the lessons that his father taught him previously. And I, I think these are all things that are all playing into why Matt feels like such a different character than he was at the beginning of the story. Um, but I do think that point of view is a big part of it, a bigger part than maybe we realise when we're only seeing things through Rand's eyes. We are really getting, and I think I questioned it at the time in, in a way that I wanted, we, I felt that we were missing a lot of things because we were only seeing through one character's eyes and I still feel that when we are only looking at things through one character's eyes. We miss things because it's their point of view. And that includes shaping the characters to be how they're perceived. So it, it's just really interesting because really there are a whole lot of things and Matt was definitely clearly designed to not be likeable for quite some time. And I think therefore through Rand's point of view, we couldn't like, or we, he obviously liked Matt's company, but we couldn't get a huge insight into Matt beforehand and what he was like because it would have been too difficult as a reader to go from liking Matt to not liking him, but also to, to jarring and also then too obvious of the effect the dagger was having on him. So a few, a few thoughts there. As he rolled the dice and kept rolling the dark one's eyes, was that his luck warning him of the five men? That suggests they're dark friends and the dark one has decided to kill him. That's, that's what I am assuming right at that moment. Unless there's another player trying to kill him. Light, what game am I playing in? I have to know the game if I'm going to win. Light, what game? Page 340, he says there. Um, and I think this is this sums up for me Matt and his approach he needs to know what's going on. It's why he holds back a little bit um, and doesn't, I mean, sometimes he just jumps in without thinking. Um, but in this, in this moment, he's really trying to suss out what's going on and he needs to know the rules of the game. He knows that with the rules of a game, he's got more chance of winning. And it goes back to things that he's learned from his dad and all sorts of things. But I do think that is a really good quote from Matt. What game am I playing in? I have to know the game if I'm going to win. And this is strategy. And he's gonna be he he's gonna be important with strategy. I can see it. I, I can just I oh anyway, I, I'm getting excited. I'm thinking Matt hasn't really accepted and understood that he is to Vern too, just as Rand is. And again, that makes sense with um with the dagger situation. He hasn't had that time to come to terms with it or to realise what that means. He doesn't have that same experience I suppose and he's looking at Tavern meaning um, Dragon Reborn meaning male Aes Sedai meaning <laughs> going crazy and rotting death and all that kind of stuff. Also he's very aware of how much he doesn't know and that goes against what he knows of winning and I think yeah that's what I was saying with that quote he knows what he doesn't know he knows that he doesn't know the rules of the game he's playing right now his real life game and he needs to know if he wants to win. Um, and he, I think he's worked out by this stage, he's never going to understand the rules of the Aes Sedai fully. But I'm hoping Tom will be able to help him understand some of that world, the Aes Sedai, the political world, all that kind of stuff. Um, so he knows a bit more of the rules. How far will luck take him before he has, before he has a chance to strategize? So luck will only get him so far, it will turn the tide, it, it might buy him time, but he needs to learn those rules and work out what's going on. It's really good to see Rand again here, even if it's a really worrying scene. Celine is driving him forward towards the sword, which is not great. So obviously Lanfia, Celine, because Rand has no idea it's Lanfia, but she is trying, she's manipulating this. She's getting them all, as far as I can see, she's trying to get them all to tear because that's what stage of the game she wants it to be up to, even though that's not necessarily what the Aes Sedai wanted to be happening. They wanted Rand to learn more before he, they went to Tyr. Um, she wants this She wants this to happen. She wants this to happen now. So Lanfrey is sending them all in that direction. Um, but Rand particularly, maybe not all of them. She's not really 
anyway she's she's manipulating the situation and I still don't quite know why um other than obviously she wants Rand and she wants Rand to accept his power and like I get that but why is she doing it the why I'm asking is she doing it purely for herself and is she then going to set herself up as better than the dark one or is this all in service of the dark one but just in her warped way or it, it's the dark one and her it's that's what I'm asking that's the that's what I'm unsure about I'm not you don't need to answer me I'm unsure about her motives in regards to the dark one I get her motives um it's the dark one that I'm just not sure about she wants to be better than the other forsaken so therefore um I don't think she wants to be I don't think she's setting herself up to be greater than the dark one I don't think that's it I don't think that's even registered on her but I just anyway still piecing land fear together um, so not being able to trust his dreams and lack of sleep is going to make him more on edge and sloppier and I think this lack of sleep and this driving force pushing him forward is really what's going wrong with Rand at the moment more so than his mental stability He'll appear worse than he is, maybe, um, worse than he is mentally due to lack of sleep and the single-minded focus on ending this. He still doesn't believe he's the Dragon Reborn, but has figured out he has to play the game to the end for this to end. And if he goes to Tia, then this will end sooner rather than later. That's You can sort of see that working through what he's doing. Now, I'm worried about the image of Neneva, Gwen and Elaine in a cage. Is it going to come to pass in some way or is it just one possibility? Is Matt going to end up in tier, tier as well? I think that's where the boat is going, not to Morgais. So what effect will that have on the Queen and Elaine if he goes to Tier and not to the Queen to deliver the letter? And obviously I, I've kept reading so I know what's going on there. Um, lots lots of questions that was a big chapter for many reasons but also not a lot happened it just a lot it prompted a lot of thoughts anyway, chapter 33 within the weave and we're back to Perrin I really felt for him during the conversation with Moraine regarding the pattern being neither good nor evil I could just feel some of his remaining innocence he was clinging to smash into a million pieces it's a hard lesson for anyone to learn that things are not good or evil. They just they just are, and you have to make the best of it. And they can be manipulated. And you could just oh, felt his heart or his soul being crushed. I'm hoping a Gwen will be able to explain the dream world to Rand and Perrin a little bit more when they next meet. It might help them both get sleep. They can't go on with little sleep for much longer. They need to, to be able to sleep. They need to be able to work with what they've got or what they're able to access. And I don't even know if Rand is actually able to access it properly or if he just find him, finds himself there and everyone finds themselves there at different times. I don't know. We'll find more out about Rand and the dream world at some point. I can feel something is about to happen for or to Perrin. The reminder about the ailment in the cage from Min's prophetic image helps explain some of the tension, but still, it's a mystery here. Will it involve the wolves or a conversation, or is it linked to the mysterious woman who attracted his attention? Um, it's nice to see Lowell get a little love from strangers. That's really nice. Um, and good for him too. It, because it must be really difficult. <laughs> I'm speaking as if he's a real person. It must be really difficult to always be feared and mistaken for a Trolloc. But they obviously know what an Ogier is in this part of the world. And so he's getting a warmer welcome and like a really happy welcome often. And it's nice for a change and for his ego <laughs> in a way. Lord Auburn on his hunt is probably lying about there being 20 ailmen. I can't imagine them running away at all. And I love how it's repeated that he lost six men, but they killed all of the 20 that didn't run away. I'm looking forward to hearing the true story. I think that'll be great. 
Lan clearly doesn't believe such a man as Auburn could have survived the encounter given he may have come across Ailman. I know they've run into Ailman. No, actually, we don't know if Lan has. I'm assuming Lan has had an encounter with Ailman at some point in his past. Did he fight in the Ail War 20 years previous? I don't know. Um, so I think what was really funny about this is that they just kept saying he lost six men, but they killed all of the 20 that didn't run away, but they didn't specify how many they killed. They just said all of the 20 that didn't run away, we got. But that could have meant they killed one person. It could have meant none. Um, it could have meant they killed all 20. And I just love the ambiguity of what he was saying. He was making it sound like it was a bigger deal than it really was. Um, this, yeah, anyway, it's a cool little scene. Um, cool little thing. I don't know how much relevance that particular thing will have to the overall story, but I, I think this is, it's great that we're, um, we're sort of getting a little bit more information about ale people. Chapter 34, a different dance. I really appreciate that Perrin sat down and thought about everything he'd seen that day, trying to piece it together. Do I like that he wasn't ex as excited as Lowell about the tree song bed? No, but I appreciate him trying to work, work it all out. It's not something you often see. And I know it happens, but in fantasy books as a whole, you don't often see them just sit down and process it. I just need time to process this. And that's what Perrin is like. He needs time to process things. And I love that that's a part of his character. And I love that it's so different to Rand in this situation who rushed off without thinking it through um, and Matt, is reactive often and I think Matt probably sits in that in-between point. He can be strategic when he needs to, he can do what Perrin can do, but he can also act like Rand can act. Um, so they all balance each other out in different ways. Releasing the ailman was exactly what I expected him to do. As soon as I saw him in the cage, I'm like, Perrin's gonna go rescue him or do something. He doesn't like people in cages. So I had thought he'd wait till closer to morning, but I'm not overly surprised that he didn't. It was partially a reaction to the cage, but I think he knew he needed to do it. I think it was an important part of um, the pattern that Perrin had or was pushed to, to do. So I'm expecting that Gaul will be of help later in the story at some point, owing Perrin his life. I'm expecting to see him again down the track. Potentially later in this book in Tia. Maybe, maybe not. Will he be Rand's first ale support or will he come across his own, um, or will Rand come across his own given there appears to be many looking for him right now? How will he react to that, to that given he's still coming to terms with being adopted? I don't know. I I think that could be really interesting to see how Rand interacts with the ale people. Perrin having to kill more white cloaks has got to be a joke, right? He's now going to be a bigger target than he already was, given it won't take much for someone to give his description. And someone like Bornhold Jr. or Bayer to put it together and realize that it was Perrin. It won't be hard to get his name either, I suppose. I worry, I'm beginning to really, really worry for Perrin's family back in Ebensfield. I'm actually really terrified for them and what all this means for them. Um, given the white cloaks are focused on him and Bornhold Jr. wants revenge. Um, I'm really scared for Perrin's family and I think I'm justified in that fear. I hope that I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. I guess Moraine was worried about a false dragon because that would mean either Rand wasn't who she thought or something else was wrong with the pattern because I believe we know that the false dragons were showing up with more... Um, more regularity because the dragon reborn was coming and if more were showing up then it meant that Rand wasn't who wasn't the dragon reborn and she had to go back to looking 
Fun that Perrin walked in on her naked. <laughs> you won't repeat that mistake. I mean, it's just this fun little thing, of course. Like, um, anyway. And who is the woman or girl who saw him free Gaul? Is she an enemy or friend, given she probably watched the whole thing without, without interrupting? I don't know. Interesting. Intriguing. Also, it makes sense Lord Auburn lied. One ailman dead one captured that makes sense um and yeah two ailmen together taking out six of his men yeah i can see that happening now the last chapter for today is the oh, chapter 35 the falcon Whew. it was easier it was an easier getaway than i anticipated um definitely helped by the mystery surrounding that Ailman and how he got away. Um, Fail. That is a name I've heard before. Definitely going to be important to Perrin's story. I think this is one of those things that um, means that I'm not on social, like I'm not on Twitter as often as I would like to be. I really enjoy being on Twitter, but I've jumped off a little bit because Fail was one of those names that kept coming up and I was getting too many ideas about what was coming and what was to happen because of that. Um, but anyway, I love that Perrin is blaming Min for the seeing or the heads up that somehow a falcon would be part of his journey. Looking forward to getting to know her more. She seems like she could be really good for Perrin. So I'm looking forward to seeing what she brings to the story. Um, I think that could be a lot of fun. It's hard to say how Moraine has reacted to Perrin's decision to set Gaul free. She probably won't acknowledge it in a major way, but I'd be interested to know if she knew of Min's reading of Perrin. Because if that was the case, and she knew that there was a caged ailman in the reading, that would have made her expect trouble of some kind, and she would have been ready to leave much quicker if that was the case. So honestly, I don't know what she thinks, whether she's, um, anyway. And, I love that Fail is out seeking adventure, ready to embrace a new name and identity and going in directions she didn't plan. So different to Perrin who just wants a quiet life in Eamon's field. And I think that's really what he is going to need, even if she's only in it short term, which I don't think she is. Um, but I think that will help having someone who is so clearly his opposite in many ways will be good for Perrin to deal with the unexpected um, and the, this life that he didn't choose. Obviously, it's no coincidence that she was planning on looking for the horn so close to his home. And it's an interesting connection then, given Matt, um, Manatharan and the horn, I think, that is really a cool little bit of extra information that we didn't have that could come back into play. I wonder what led her to think that it's there. That would be cool to find out. And if they'll end up in the mountains maybe and try stop whatever danger is in Eamon's field from the white cloaks and Fane and all that kind of thing from the mountains um, as opposed to going the other way, the way that they left. Um, there's a whole lot of things that excite me about finding out a little bit more about that area, that the forbidden area, I know that's not what it's called, but those areas um, around the two rivers that they just don't go into and knowing um, different things that we've learnt at different times. I don't think we've got up to all of it, but I'm just really excited to see a little bit more about the history of, um, of the two rivers area and how it links in with a few different things and I'm assuming we'll get to see that at some point. So that's me done for today and um, that was chapters 28 to 35. I know it was a little bit late, I'm really sorry, um, I'm trying. <laughs> um, I do intend, if everything goes according to plan, I'm going to have four videos out this week. I do want to finish The Dragon Reborn by the end of October. Um, and then I'm still trying to work out what November is going to look like for me in regards to the videos, but I'll get to that. I'll, I've got the week to decide. Um, but anyway, that is it. Um, get down in the comments. Let me know how you're going. <laughs> um, tell me, um, uh, tell me what you thought. I don't know. I'm, I'm just interested to hear how you're going with the book, what's going on 
anything exciting going on in your in your in your life um help me live through someone else, some other people and what they're doing um it's just life is busy sometimes and that's fine i'm okay with that um we like busy sometimes anyway i'm gonna head off and go do other things and get this out for you tonight and i will catch you with another video hopefully tomorrow if not tomorrow the day after bye